webinar, uh, loss prevention webinar, is on complete risk management. Um, how do we build a program that will cover all the bases? This is a giant subject, and we're going to try to keep it to, uh, to 45 minutes or less, and uh, hopefully. <laughs> and uh, how do we go about putting all of this stuff together? Let's see. Hold on well, just one second. Oh, it looks like you're answering. All right. I just wanted to make sure it looked like we had somebody that didn't have audio. Um, so I've got uh, this next slide was ripped from the headlines. This happened over the weekend. So if you're able to watch this video, pay attention to what's going on. Demolition Derby, and we had a great wreck there. Launched uh, a tip to the car over a drive line. Um, a drive line flew off of that truck that was wrecked and flew clear across the, the arena and landed in the top of the arena and, and injured, I think, at least three people. That happened over the weekend. Um, we sit back and go, holy cow, who, do, who, could have prevent, who could have thought of that happening? How could we have prevented that? Um, and then we take our, turn our minds back to risk management. How do we, how do we pr pr uh, protect our organizations from those things that could happen out there. Well, we have um, plenty of examples, and, and it, as you watch our training and we talk about these things, we have some pretty scary stuff that happens. Eight-figure auto accident, that's a lot of money. You start counting fingers and toes um, when, we start, when we start adding up the cost of some of these, some of these claims. Um, we've had worker fatalities over, over the years. Um, crazy things happen, trench collapses, constitutional claims, police liability, um, any one of a number of things. Matter of fact, each year we, uh, we process about 1,700 claims with the trust. Um, that's, a lot of, that's a lot of claims. Um, a, lot of, a lot of opportunity for us to get into trouble, to have, have some financial losses. And, uh, and we all partner, partner together. You partner with the trust <clears throat> for us to be able to, uh, you know, so we, we work together to cover each other, other's losses. We pay the, pay the bills at the end of the day, but all of us own the cost. All of us own the price of that because partnering together, we pool our resources. Uh, about $10 million annually in, in losses that we see. One of, the, one of the concerning trends that we see is a continuing loss or erosion of immunity. Um, we, have, we have governmental immunity written into, written into the, the books, the, the state codes. Um, however, case by case, we're slowly losing that. And that's a concern to, should be a concern to all of us. It's a concern to us at the, at the trust because it, it uh, um, it increases our exposure, the potential losses that we may see, and, and we have to pass that on to, to all of our members as that, as that happens. Okay, so that is definitely a, definitely a concern, and, and uh, many times we'll, we'll fight a claim all the way, uh, all the way um, through the court process to ensure that we don't start a, uh, start a precedent that could, that could cost us for decades or forever in the, in the future. All right. So today we want to cover really what are um, what are our risks? How do we build a program that will really cover everything that we need to? Not just worker safety, not just general liability, but all of those risks that are around us. Um, we'll talk about how we how we avoid that liability, how we expose ourselves to liability, and we'll talk about some best practices as we go along. I want to start out with with some definitions. Um, exposure, the state of being subject to a loss because of some hazard or contingency. If we own a building, we have some exposure. Uh, we have exposure that that building might burn down. We have exposure that somebody, maybe the UPS delivery person or, or somebody like that, pizza delivery person, comes to our facility and they slip and fall because of, uh, because of an unsafe condition, we have exposure that we might be sued um, to, uh, to make that person whole because of their, the injuries that they've happened. If we own a car, we have exposure, um, whether it's just sitting in the parking lot or whether we're driving, that increases and decreases based on the use and based on the, the time that we're using. But we all have exposure out there 
and we need to identify that. If we haven't thought through what could happen, um, we basically have our head in the sand. We're not uh, we're not uh, aware of what could we could be facing. All right, another definition: a hazard. Hazard is a situation that poses a, a threat, a level of threat to life, health, property, or the environment. So that's kind of a general definition there. What are the hazards that um, that are facing us? A hazard can be either known or unknown. Um, it's our obligation to identify and correct as many of those hazards as we possibly can. All right. The next one, a moral hazard, kind of a, a kind of a similar thing. It's a danger, and it involves our trustworthiness, honesty, how we interact with with others. So if we if we um, are untrustworthy, dishonest in our in our dealings, that's a moral hazard. Um, next, the next and final definition is risk. Risk is a probability. Um, let's read it: a probability or threat of damage, injury, liability, loss, or any other negative negative occurrence that is caused by external or internal vulnerabilities, and that, and that may be avoided through preemptive action. Okay. Well, that's a that's a big long definition of what it is. As I look at risk, it's a probability that takes into account. Um, it takes into, into account the likelihood and the severity. So probability and severity that is going to happen. Um, could it happen? And if it does, how bad is that? With those two um, pieces of information, we can determine if, the, if, that's, a, uh, if that's a risk to our organization. Um, could a meteorite come out of the sky and, and hit our building right now? The answer is yes. Um, what's the severity if that happens? Well, it's a, it's a pretty catastrophic event. We'd probably lose a lot of life, maybe lose the entire building. What is the probability? Probability is very low. I'm not going to put that high on my, on my risk register that I, have to, that I have to worry about that. But each of, us, each of our organizations needs to sit back and look at, um, based on the activities that we, that we undertake, the facilities that we own, the equipment that we operate, all of those things, we need to look at what the potential risks are. And I'll ask you a question. Do you, have, you, <clears throat> have, have you identified your top five risks? Um, have, you written those, have you written those down? If you look on this, <clears throat> this little matrix here, it's an interesting way um, to evaluate our risk. We look at the likelihood and the consequence. So is it rare? Is it almost certain that this will happen uh, or something in between? How bad is it? Is it, is it severe? And we, and we plot it on the, on the matrix and determine, is this something that we really need to pay a lot of attention to? Well, this is almost, almost certain to happen and the, and the likelihood, or excuse me, and the consequence is, is trivial. Well, maybe we don't worry about that one very much. That's going to happen, but, it, but it's not going to have a major effect um, on our operations or on our people. But if we have something that is, that is almost certain to happen and it's severe in its likelihood, we need to place all of our resources towards that one risk to prevent it from happening. Okay? All right. <clears throat> so our, our first step as we start to develop a risk management program is to really know what our risks are. We need to name those things, write them out um, onto, a, onto a piece of paper, onto a spreadsheet. Um, I've, got a, I've got a simple spreadsheet that I'll, that I'll send out <clears throat> called a risk register. And on that, we take those top five risks in each category. <clears throat> I was afraid of that tickle this morning when I woke up. <laughs> um, so we line those out on that risk register. We, we give, those, give those risks a name, and we prioritize them. What is our most critical thing? This is the, the biggest hazard, as, or is the, is the biggest consequence, as well as the, the highest likelihood and we put our efforts towards that. We put those on a list and we create an action plan. After we prioritize those things, here's what we're going to do. So I'll ask you a question. <clears throat> who, 
who is responsible? Who's the responsible party where you live? Who is re where you work? Who is responsible for risk? Um, of course, you guys, you guys all understand that that we're all part of that uh, part of the the program. We're all responsible. At the end of the day, it's going to be <clears throat> our governing body. Um, in a city, it's the it's the mayor and the council. At a county, we've got a, a, a council or a commission and, and a board at a, at a district. That group is ultimately holding the bag if something goes wrong. However, each and every one of us has responsibilities um, as it comes to managing risk. Um, management is an essential part of having a having an effective program. So in our TAP program, we talk about having a safety committee, and we, we use the terminology safety committee versus risk committee just to make it, as, to make it simple, um, to help people understand what, um, what our goals are. But really, you could, you, you could uh, swap that out for risk committee, and the responsibilities really don't change that much. And we think that that committee is the essential part to having having success when it comes to managing safety, managing risk at your organization. Management has got to be involved. Somebody who can write a check needs to be heading that committee. Somebody who owns the the actions at the end of the day. So, um, so uh, take a look at your committee and say, how often are we meeting? Do we have a management? Do we have that chief executive or or somebody who can write a check? That is responsible for um, for chairing that committee doesn't mean they have to take it. They have to uh, uh, run the committee, but they need to be there and uh, and take action when it's when it's necessary. How about legal counsel? Do you want legal counsel involved with your risk committee? And I say yes. Um, as we start talking about moral hazards, we start talking about legal compliance issues. All of these things as we're outlining outlining our risk. Um, legal counsel should be a, should be a part of that. So if we've got counsel on staff, they absolutely should be involved. Um, if they're outside counsel, we we probably should um, you know plan and prepare a meeting so we have the the appropriate information uh, to share with the counsel and get their guidance uh, from a legal aspect. And then everybody uh, should be involved. Who should be on your committee? We've talked about that a lot. We don't we don't give you. Um, Specific guidance on there, but somebody from each different functional area, functional unit in your organization should be on the committee. Uh, whether that's a department head or just a, a line employee, doesn't matter. It's it, it's really up to you. But they should should want to be there. Uh, risk committee's duties: they need to identify what our risks are, rank those risks, recommend controls, and then follow up and track what they do. Pretty, uh, pretty simple to put it on one page, but it's a, it's an important job and something that takes uh, that takes effort and takes people who are serious about doing the job. All right. So I'll ask you again: What are your top five risks? Have you written those down? Um, if you haven't, take some time um, as we finish up the, the webinar today. Take some time. And, and write those write those out. Now you you probably can't have detailed information. <clears throat> oh, it looks like we lost the audio, and now it has <laughs> now it has reappeared. Apologize. I hope hope that's uh, not something on my end. Brent, Doug, are we all right there? Did we lose it for a minute? It sounds fine. I hear it. Okay. All right. Very good. We'll keep going. Identify those top five risks, and I would look at those in in each of the categories, general liability, workers' compensation, and, and you can trim that down if you want to just have two or three, um, but write those, uh, write those down and prioritize. Okay. Um, here's, a, here's just a simple risk register um, where, we, where we'll identify what those risks are, uh, put a number on those, describe what it is. So here, the example I have here, employees operate cars to perform duties or motor vehicles. Okay. Pretty simple thing. Consequences: automobile accidents. Okay, um, what's the severity? And we rank that. A lot of times, the tendency is to make a, to make the severity of five or the highest level of severity on a lot of things. Well, let's be let's be reasonable. If we had a if we had a severity of, of five on automobile accidents, none of us would go anywhere. 
So let's, even though we can have a, a really severe accident, let's look at uh, let's look at this from a from a real um, objective point of view and put those down. What's the probability that it will happen? And then multiply those two out, and that gives us our our overall risk. What's our ranking? Well, since we only have one on this spreadsheet, because I was just throwing an example together, we'll call the risk ranking one. Are we going to accept or deny that risk? Well, what the heck does that mean? Can we just say we're not going to drive cars? Well, we can make that decision. Um, with any of these risks, we need, to, we need to make a conscious decision. I'm going to either accept or deny that risk. How do I deny it? Well, we don't perform that, that function. We don't do that, do that operation. And then we also put on their controls. What type of controls do I have in place to address this? So with, so with um, employees driving cars, we'll have driver qualification policy, with, which means that we check our check employees' MVRs each month and verify their um, verify their driving records. We uh, we may perform uh, maybe maybe um, provide training for the for that employee involving defensive driving or or specific coaching. So write those things down. All right. Let's look at risk categories: financial, general liability, property, workers' compensation. Financial risk. This is something we don't talk about a lot because it's a little bit outside of the outside of the bailiwick of, of uh, our tr our traditional exposures with the trust. But everybody has financial risk. Um, what what does that mean? Well, are, are we going to be put out of business? Now, if you're in a business. This is, this is one of those major things. It doesn't uh, always get involved in our risk committee and, and uh, the overall risk management process, but this is something that we should identify. We need to identify those fiduciary duties. Um, who in our organization would, would qualify as a fiduciary um, that has a financial responsibility to others? Is there a legal obligation for them to be bonded um, or have other, other types of protection um, if they if they fail in their in their duty, identify those uh, those as well. Once again, this should be part of our overall risk picture as we look at all, we look at a, at uh, the overall risk for our organization. Um, this should be identified as well. All right, the next one, general li um, general liability. This is the one that most of us think about, um, whether it be uh, whether it be sewer backups or slips and falls on our properties or or any one of a number of, uh, of other things or drive shafts flying off of a truck at the demolition derby, um, we look at general liability. We need to ask ourselves, what could go wrong in our operations? Um, and uh, not just what has happened at our operations in the past, but we need to look outside of there. We need to look outside of the box and say, what do we see? Well, we've done a demolition derby for, for 20 years and we've never had a problem like that. Well, we need to open our eyes to, to the potential that is out there and the experience others have had. Over the past uh, few years, we've had, we've had a couple of fatalities at demolition derbies and, and, uh, and other problems that have happened there. So in that 20 years, we may not have had, had those issues, but we need to be realistic that they do happen out there and we need to be aware of, of what's there and what controls we have to put in place to, to, um, to be able to, to address those. Um, use, use our resources. We have, we have a variety of resources that we can provide um, anywhere from, from on-site risk assessments where we help you identify what your risks are to, uh, to training, to documentation, um, and uh, and many other resources that uh, that all you've got to do is ask, and we will help you, and we'll help you wherever we can. Also, ask others, people who are doing similar types of activities. Share your information. Um, do you have a good policy for this or that? All right. Let's look at the next one. Workers' compensation. Um, once again, ask yourself what could go wrong. What's your experience? And, uh, and, and what are our legal obligations? As we look at OSHA, we do a lot of training on, on loss prevention. Here, here are your OSHA obligations to, to protect employees. So we want to satisfy those as well as looking at the common losses that, um, and the outlandish ones as, as well. 
you know, we look at um, we look at these losses, and and our our most common are sprains and strains. Um, there, the, that's where we should put a lot of our efforts. However, we have things have, we have things come up like people falling out of the back of trucks. Um, we've had multiple cases of that. And people fall out of trucks for a number of reasons. Sometimes the trucks are moving, sometimes they're not. Sometimes it's a trailer. Um, and uh, what kind of resources can we look there? What kind of programs can we look, put into place? Doug did a presentation a, a few weeks ago on three points of contact. That's a great resource on preventing that kind of outlandish claim that we see. All right, property risks. Um, if we own property, um, it is at risk of burning, um, having an earthquake, um, many other uh, many other risks that are out there when when we own property. So, as we as we look at this, you have property coverage with the trust. You need to verify that your properties are scheduled. We need to know what we know what we own. Occasionally, we'll have. Um, we will have a situation where where a member calls up and and uh, or probably the better example is we do a a an, a property appraisal and we find a million dollar piece of uh, piece of property a building or whatever it is that is not on their property schedule um, that's a that's one of those real gulp moments <laughs> where you're where you go oh my gosh. What if that building would have uh, would have been burned down or had an earthquake um, knock it down? That could have, that could be a complete disaster. So regularly, I would say at least annually, we need to go through all of our property and ensure it's on the schedule. Motor vehicles are the same way. Um, other pieces of, of mobile equipment also need to be be on there. If you want it to be if you want it to be covered. Make sure it's scheduled. So you've got a park out in the out in the middle of uh, you know out in the middle of your city somewhere, and it has a a play structure on there. We just spent fifty thousand dollars to put this play structure in place. Do you want that covered under property uh, property coverage? It needs to be scheduled. Uh, so verify that. We're going to be starting our property appraisals here uh, within within the next few weeks, probably within the next month. Um, and uh, and and the uh, third party that we've got doing that for us will be contacting you. Um, they'll start with those who have come on new to the trust in in recent months and have not had a have not had a property appraisal, and then they'll work through the entire membership. And so and so this is a great opportunity for you to really look at the values of your properties and and ensure that they are um, that they are adequately covered. And that they're scheduled on on your list. Let's see. Um, here's a here's a another thing. Just while we're on property, because it's on uh, kind of on the top of my mind as we were talking about uh, the appraisals. Um, what about the contents in your in your building? You should be documenting those things, particularly if you have some high value items. Um, but if you're lazy like I am. You can videotape those and save it onto a server somewhere. So if your building burns down, you've got a you've got a good record of, of what the contents of the of the building were. And just throw one thing out there: if you have fine art, um, things that are that have a uh, a higher uh, you know a, an intrinsic value to them, fine art, sculptures, paintings, those types of things, those should be scheduled separately. Um, to put a value on those. Otherwise, they they would be valued simply for the for the value of the of the materials, you know, paint and canvas and and a, and a frame. Um, so so if you do have those high value items, talk with your talk with your account executive, and they can they can help verify that you've got adequate coverage on on those things. Um, make sure you cover yourself. If you make a decision to not schedule a, a piece of property. I would get a buy-off from your governing body. If, if that's not you, if you're if, if you're managing these things and say, oh, that's an old um, an old barn that was donated to our uh, to our organizations for you know we want the property later on to build a to build a facility there, but it has a barn on it. I'm going to make a decision. We're not going to we're not going to schedule that. I would I would 
go to your go to your governing body and say this is what I'm proposing and get them to buy off. Just protect yourself when it when it comes to this. So if the old barn burns down and uh, and there happens to be a you know a Ferrari stored in the old barn, that's that's to wake Doug up to say so if he's snoring. There's a Ferrari stored in the old barn. Um, are we covered that way? Make sure you protect yourself when it comes to property coverage. And then do do regular, I, I threw this one in because I, I, um, I don't think we do nearly enough inspections. And this, and this counts not just for property, but for all of our facilities looking at, uh, Doug says he's not, store, he's not snoring. He didn't say he was not sleeping, but he's not snoring. Um, it, it, it doesn't, doesn't matter which one of these exposures that we're dealing with, we should be doing regular inspections. That's to verify if our fire extinguishers are there and they're in good shape, to make sure that we have adequate egress so if we have a fire, people can safely get out of the building, that we don't have slip and fall hazards. This is an essential part of our overall risk program is monitoring what's going on. We can put programs in place, but if we don't regularly go out and monitor what's happening, um, it, uh, it, it may go awry. <clears throat> All right. Um, cyber risk. This is a this is a new coverage that we added this this year, <clears throat> and so you and so you do have this protection. <clears throat> what is cyber? <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> what is cyber risk? Well, it's really if 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 we are um, subject to hacking, if we if we release data, it almost seems like once a week there'll be one of the big retailers, big companies in the country that will suffer a hack and they lose customer data um, to hackers out there who can then use it for identity theft. Um, do we have, a, do we process any kind of that customer data, personal data involving birth dates, um, social security numbers, other information that can be put together and, and create a false identity? Um, if so, we should have a policy in place and and take action on that. We need to train our people what's what's appropriate, um, how what type of modes of communication that we can use, how it's how it's stored. Our information officers need to be involved with this on how to protect our infrastructure and and set those systems up so we so we don't lose that. All right, threw that one in there because it's new coverage that we're dealing with. Um, so our next step is how do we handle these risks once, once we've identified those? Sorry, I went, I went into a few best practices because I just couldn't help myself. Um, so minimizing risk, there, there are multiple techniques to, to minimize that. Number one is called risk avoidance. If we don't do the activity, <clears throat> we don't have the risk. If we decide we're not going to, not going to uh, have a, a demolition derby, for example, we don't bear the risk of, of having somebody get run over or have parts fly out and hit somebody in the, um, in the stands. Um, that's not very fun, but that's our decision that, that we can make. You watch the guy over the weekend that, that uh, sky, did a skydive without a parachute and landed in a, in a net. If we don't do that, we don't have the risk of splattering on the ground. I'll report that he did, <laughs> he did make it. Um, he did live through that. It was um, pretty crazy in my mind, and I wouldn't consider that. Um, and we should really consider um, our constituents out there and our organization before we decide to do any activity. Okay? Um, so if we decide not to do it, we don't have the risk. But some things we don't really have a choice on. Risk retention. If we don't identify this, if we don't do anything about it, the risk is still there. Um, the risk is still there that that uh, that we might get sued, that we may have an employee hurt, all of those things that could happen. But it's um, but it's on us. We own it if we decide to do that. Now, some organizations de decide to be self-insured. Um, to do that, they have to they have to put together a war chest and and uh, and it and and manage their program. That's pretty risky um, for most organizations. Um, the rest of us will transfer that risk to the trust. Um, we share that risk together and, and really to, to all of our member, member entities around the state 
we share our risk. <clears throat> so that's that's really the next one is risk transference. Can we transfer this risk to somebody else? That's why we buy insurance. We buy an insurance policy, a liability policy on our automobiles. So if we're involved in an accident, that insurance company is, is on the hook to pay for, for those losses. Um, we also want to protect ourselves through risk transference um, through, through policies and procedures that we run. When we engage a contractor to do work for our organization, um, there, is, there may be risk transference, but there may not. We need to intentionally go out and protect ourselves from, uh, from risk from that contractor doing, a, um, doing something inappropriate or failing in their, in their duties, something negligent. So what do we do? We secure an indemnification agreement. We should do that as, as, we, uh, um, as we start the RFP process. Let them know that they need to have insurance coverage, that they, that they, need, to be, that they need to be licensed and bonded and whatever it may be uh, what, for the type of contractor that we're dealing with. But secure an indemnification agreement and a certificate of insurance that lists our organization as an additional insured on their policy. Now, if they're a contractor worth their salt, there's no, there, there will be no issue to this at all. They're used to doing this on a, on a daily basis, and they'll have a certificate back to you in, in no time. If they fight this, I would consider a different contractor. Um, this, is a, this is a normal process in, in doing business, and a normal cost of doing business. Um, and, so, and so if they don't do this, get a different contractor. Um, we look at events. Uh, we may be organizing, uh, we may have a, a, an event, special event that, that we want to have happen in our community. Let's look at how can we transfer that risk. Say we have a, uh, say we have a run, maybe it's a, a marathon or something like that. Is there an event promoter that will take the risk on this? So we do the same thing. We, we secure an indemnification agreement and certificate of insurance to protect us, but that's a great way to limit our exposure. Okay. All right. I think I covered that. Just um, on this, make sure we have adequate contract language. Talk to your legal counsel <clears throat> anytime you engage in, in a contract. Um, and, and you ask about limits. Well, <clears throat> how, how high should our limits be? It really depends on the activity that's involved. If we've got uh, if we've got somebody um, coming in to do uh, cleaning, maybe maintenance at uh, at our, we'll engage a contractor to do janitorial services in our building. Um, how big is that risk as compared to the demolition derby? And so our limits need to be really commensurate with the, with the amount of risk that we're seeing. I will throw out one thing. Um, the governmental immunity limit is about $2.41 million, and that's, a, that's kind of a moving target. It changes from year to year, um, and, but just keep that in mind as we're looking at limits. Um, and once again, go back to those additional insured certificates of insurance. Sometimes we have people, uh, people do things on our property, whether they be, um, whether they be a, con or a vendor or just somebody renting our facilities out. Um, in those cases, we have a couple of programs. Uh, TULIP is for tenant users liability. So if they're renting our facilities for, for whatever purpose, this is a way that they can get coverage if they don't have it. They may already, may already have that and they can give you a certificate of insurance. Otherwise, TULIP coverage is a way to protect them. Um, if somebody's coming onto our property, say we've got town days going on, and we have a, and we have vendors out selling stuff, selling selling products um, in a in a booth. Um, how do we verify that they have coverage? What happens if if the the uh, group is selling food, and and they don't practice very good food safety, and a whole bunch of people get sick? Could that come back on our on our organization? Um, well, there's definitely a potential there. So. 
ensuring that this that this organization, the vendor, has coverage is really important. If they don't have it, there's a, a really easy way to do it. We don't have anything to do with this company, but we found that they had um, very cheap coverage, and uh, and it was fairly easy to get. It's called fastcov.com. That's a that's an easy way to, for those type of people to get coverage, and it's like I say, very reasonable from a cost standpoint. What about contractors? Um, there have been some kind of concern concerning legal trends decisions for, uh, at a federal level uh, with OSHA, the National Labor Relations Board, that really make me nervous about relationship between between us and a contractor. Um, Making a, making it a very close relationship. It just reinforces the the need for us to contractually indemnify ourselves, to give us a, give us an arm's length protection from um, from liability with these guys. Okay. All right. Um, I think we covered covered that material. One of the one of the essential parts of a of a fully rounded risk management program is having some metrics, tracking our performance, seeing how we're, how we're doing. If we don't keep score, we're only practicing. So we need to see how we're performing uh, this year compared to last year, um, how we're performing compared to other organizations similar to ourselves. And, uh, and this is an essential part of a, of a well-rounded program. So why do we monitor our performance? We don't want to have the same problem happen again. That's why in our in our safety slash risk committees, we do incident investigations. We look at near misses. We look at all of these um, uh, things that have happened and the things that potentially could happen, and then um, and then address those as best we can. Um, identify areas that are hurting performance. Identify our blind spots. We need to sit down as a group and and throw and throw our uh, throw our operations out on the table and say what could go wrong what has gone wrong and then track that from from where we uh, from where we have performed in the past we also want to see where we've been successful we want to celebrate those successes when we when we do that and share those as a as a pool the trust should uh, should share and that's that's part of our obligation as well is to share who's doing really well you know, we've got the sewer summit coming up so we have some of our members coming in to talk about what they've done to to be successful um, and uh, and if we do this, let's let's use this as an opportunity to build our uh, build our morale with our with our employees and and the community, and uh, and really get some some good press. All right. Um, what what do your standards mean, or what do your what do your numbers mean? What type of metrics should we use? If you say we only had ten injuries this year, well. That, that's lacking some information, right? We need to compare that to a standard. Well, we had 10 injuries and we had we only have five employees working here. We've got a pretty terrible incident rate. If we've got a thousand people working there, um, then it, then it's a different rate, and we can uh, we can look at that at a at, um, with some um, yeah look at it from a, from the appropriate angle. Okay. Normalizing. So what type of data should we use? We should tie to something that is common. If we're looking at employee injuries, hours worked is the is the common link. If we can compare that from, from one organization to another, that'll let us know that that rate is, whether it's good or bad. Um, how number of autos that we have in our, in our fleet, and that's one of the one of the things that we look at look at as well, is how many incidents Per 100 autos, I think 100 is our number, um, or maybe it was just per vehicle. How many incidents per vehicle do we have in a year? Compare ourselves to, to others. We can also use expenditures. You know, given our budget, our overall operating expenditures, how many incidents do we have? Okay. Um, there are tons of sources out there. Bureau of Labor Statistics will give us information based on the type of, of workers that are out there, the injuries that they, that they have had. Um, NTSB will give us information on, on crash statistics for vehicles, Safety Council, other industry groups. Um, there are uh, tons of great normalizing um, 
organizations out there that'll give us the data that we need. But as we look at these, as we look at the metrics that will help us get better, what uh, what direction we, should we go? Uh, I think we really need to look at trailing indicators and leading indicators. What the heck are those? Well, a trailing indicator is something that's really happened. It's something that we that we uh, that we're looking at past performance and say, and asking ourselves, how did we do? Um, so here's a definition, a measure of safety, health, or loss that can only be calculated after a given event or time period. So over the last year, we had, we had three injuries um, happen in our, in our organization of 1,000 1, employees. So that tells us, tells us really how we did, but it's water under the bridge. So here's some, some uh, examples of that. OSHA recordable incident rates, lost time rates. Um, these are the real common ones that we see. The EMOD, this one's got that long, long time frame, right? It's a four-year history there. It's a good indicator um, for us to look at you and see, and see how you're performing, um, but it doesn't allow us to get ahead. We're, we're way behind the game when an EMOD comes into, comes into effect. Auto incident rates, similar things like that. Um, here, here, here's a whole list of things. We might even look at regulatory issues. Did we, did we get a violation, violation or a permit miss? We didn't do what we were supposed to. Regulatory agency visits, um, inspections, did we get citations from those things? But once again, those are all water under the bridge. They're things that have already happened. It's a good indicator, but it's not going to help us get ahead. Um, so. It's really a measure of our failure um, versus versus our potential for success. I took this picture. I thought it was great. So we have our have our normal number of days since a lost time accident. Does anybody see the issue? I don't know if Doug's. I, I better not pick on Doug anymore. Huh? He'll feel bad. Brent. Wow. I gotta go. If you look really close, there's a there's some open electrical in this picture on the safety performance sign. I thought that was very ironic. Um, all right, so let's talk about leading indicators. This is an, a measure that signals future events or positive efforts towards preventing injury, illness, or loss. What are we doing that will prevent this risk, prevent this loss in the future? So. Um, you know, what is going to get us where we want to go? Um, what are our values as, as an organization? And not all of these measures are, are created equally. All right. So we need to look at these, apply these um, metrics to all of the organization, um, and, and choose things that will direct us where we want to go. If those metrics um, focus us on a certain direction, that will prevent those losses in the future, and they're probably the right things, okay? Um, these should also be used to guide our governing body decisions, the decisions that they make. They should use this as a, as a, as a guiding principle or a metric. So when we make decisions, when we, when we commit resources, they should be going the right, right direction. All right, so um, one, one really good leading indicator is safety training. Are all of our departments doing safety training? Well, does that mean we're going to have, have fewer losses? Maybe, maybe not. Depends on the effectiveness of our of our training, but it definitely helps us to gauge our our commitment to preventing losses. Department inspections. Are we going out and physically inspecting our facilities once a month? Did every department do that? <clears throat> if we look at that list as a committee and we find this one department or these two departments have not committed, have not completed their their department inspections um, one time through it in the last 12 months. Where do we need to focus our efforts? It lets us know where and 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 we can follow that up with where are our accidents going to be, and uh, we can compare that to those trailing trailing numbers and correlate maybe that to to an increase in their incident rate. Okay. Um, safety committee meetings. Are we are we doing our meetings? Um, we look at things like compliments from the public. That's kind of a subjective thing, but it also lets us know how effective our our people are being. Are they are, are we getting comment compliments versus uh, versus complaints? Um, safety observations. 
we can go out periodically and look at safety belt usage, uh, personal protective equipment usage. This is, a, this is a measure of how committed our workforce is to safety and doing their job. Um, other things to look at. Um, we can look at, look ahead and say, uh, look at the percentage of our drivers with a violation on their record. Okay, what is that? Why is that a leading indicator? Well, it lets us know that if we have drivers with violations, we can probably expect more incidents to happen from them. Um, reviews from responses that we make in the public safety world. Completed safety is safety work orders. If we identify a hazard and then complete it, that uh, and, and we look at the percent of completion, percent of risk assessment findings that have been completed, that gives us an indication of what track we're on. Um, sewer manhole inspections, as, and you'll notice a lot of these are very similar to what our what our TAP requirements are. How many um, how many manholes sewer manholes do we inspect in a year? Well, does that directly go to uh, to a, uh, prevented losses? Probably so over over time because we identify those things. But it's a general indicator that we are being active in um, in our uh, system, so we know what's going on. Employee participation, and have something where we're tracking this. You know, uh, initially the first year that we did the TAP program, we we threw this executive safety accountability report out there, and it kind of confused it confused some people, and so we pulled it back. Um, we wanted you to have something that tracks how you're doing. If you're interested in this, I'll send it out with the with the list, or we'll send it out with the with the uh, risk register. But this is a this is a way that you can track, um, hopefully on a monthly basis, where we're going. Look at the leading and the trailing indicators to help us um, help us guide our decisions in the directions that we're going. Once again, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to um, we're dealing with risk. Documentation is so key. If it isn't written down, it never happened unless it's bad. Um, and so, what documentation do we do we need to uh, do we need to focus on? All kinds of things: good and bad training incidents, response to compliments, um, actions that we've taken, corrective actions, um, inspections, repairs, preventative maintenance, policies, procedures. Uh, maybe liability waivers, uh, all of these things are beneficial to our overall risk program and essential in, uh, in helping us defend a claim if it's something that we weren't responsible for. Um, okay, just looking at some comments there. Longer than I anticipated. But I want to summarize quickly. So, so to have a well-rounded risk program, we need to know what our risks are. We need to have the right team in place. Management needs to be involved. They need to have this as a have this as a a value. Uh, one thing that I that I was going to put on here, and I and I just remembered that I didn't get it on the slide, is let's look at <clears throat> uh, let's let's look at our annual reviews. Is safety and risk um, risk management a part of our annual reviews? Are are each uh, each employee is each employee that works at our organization. Are they judged on their safety performance? Do they know that that's something that they'll be judged on, and maybe maybe receive a raise or not a raise based on based on that? That that uh, conveys our commitment to this. Um, let's make this part of our key performance indicators for our overall org organization. Is how are we doing on risk? Um, let's think outside of the box. Let's ask questions, come to training, um, and, uh, and, and really be aware of, of what might happen. Use the resources that are available. We have a ton here at the Trust. There are other organizations as well that, that can help out, um, trade groups and, and similar organizations that can help us with specific um, situations. Um, don't be afraid to call Doug, Brent, or myself. We are, uh, we are at your service to, to help, you, uh, help you work through these things. If you'd like us to come to your risk committee, we would love to do that, and uh, and we can present. Um, we can we can just be there and answer questions that you may have. Um, we think this uh, we we think your um, participation and uh, and placing this as a as a 
common value in your organization is essential to be successful. Otherwise, we may just get lucky. We may prevent, we may not have losses for a few years because of luck. Uh, but unless we're being intentional, uh, we're not going to be able to prevent those forever. So, all right. Though I said a lot of words in a short amount. Okay, it was a little longer than I planned. Um, Doug Brent, any uh, any comments or questions that have come up? Well, there's one other hazard you didn't mention, and that's you know to do nothing and to not care about it is a morale hazard. You got the moral hazard and the morale hazard. You know, and to say, well, that's what we have insurance for, so we just don't worry about it and just assume that we'll let insurance take care of anything bad that happens. That's that's a, a morale hazard, and so we want to make sure that we do care about this. It's how we control our costs. It's how we keep your premiums low. You know, and that helps, and that helps everybody. That helps the entire pool. So it's really important that we uh, we take you know risk management seriously and and make great efforts and that was a good presentation i enjoyed it thanks Doug. brent anything good job jason okay. folks i don't see any questions so i've, I've gone along so i'm not going to belabor the belabor the point um, but if you do have questions please please contact us our emails are just our first name at utahtrust.gov and uh, give us a call we're happy to help out. If you've got a question, hey, I've got a, I, I, we've got a special event coming up, and you do a walk around prior prior to prior to the event to verify that we're that, that we're okay, or we've got a new process coming in. Please contact us. That's our that's our job is to help you be successful, and uh, and at the end of the day, have have all of our members be successful. So, thank you very much. Everybody, go out and have a safe day. I will see, let's see, I will send out, um, I will send out that spread, the two spreadsheets.